All right, welcome along to Team 33. I'm Raf Giallo. You can get in touch with us, as always, on Twitter. We're also on Facebook and also on iTunes. You can find all the links just at the bottom of this video. Um, so this week, our main interviewee is Neil Tovey, um, former South Africa captain. He captained the country in 1996 when they went on to win their first Africa Cup of Nations trophy and their first kind of proper major tournament after the end of apartheid and the return of the Bafana Bafana to the international stage. Neil Tovey joins me on the line from South Africa. Neil, how are you? All very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, great. And uh, delighted that you're joining us. Um, just maybe to start off, actually, from the very beginning of your story, I mean, obviously South Africa, like Ireland in a way, is a multi-sport country. Um, how did you get into soccer rather than going into rugby or cricket or some of the other sports you have in your country? Yeah, I think from the school days, I was also multi-sport and functional in a lot of sports, uh, having represented, I don't know if you call it your districts or your... And we have provinces yeah. in our in our country, in in, our, in five or six different sports. But football was always my first love. Uh, and my brother, uh, who's my Mark, who's seven years my senior, when I was the age of twelve, uh, even eleven, he, he 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 was a professional footballer at sixteen. Yeah, you know. So my early days, ten, eleven, I was already sort of going and. And, and watching him play in professional matches, and uh, and I was playing for a uh, the junior teams of, of a professional team. Yeah, and so of course, was, you know, that yeah. was where it sort of it started from. Yeah, yeah, and of course, this is the era of apartheid, of course, and um, you know there was separation of the races, and uh, soccer, of course, was associated with one, with mostly with one group. Um, so, and there was a thing called the Group Areas Act. So, how did you kind of? Uh, move against that, and what kind of personal risk was there to kind of cross those barriers? You know, sports always played a major role in 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 in, in getting rid of apartheid and 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 uh, being a major role in that process. So, so even when I was a youngster, as I said, even in my uh, young young eight, nine, ten, eleven, I was playing in the park with with all different races. So, um, it, it it wasn't. You know, ultimately, you know, totally that disregard. It was it was played by all the different races, but it was just the, the main entities of the professional game were separated, uh, and and obviously the junior leagues were separated in the different racial racial barriers. But the game was played by everyone. Yeah. And and um, and then when I became a junior professional. Uh, Football was a leading role in uh, in 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 1978. Football was already a joint forces, so you had all the different racial groups. They were a joint forces, and became uh, known as the NPSL, the National Professional Soccer League, which which incorporated all the different ethnic groups. So football, although the country was was an apartheid uh, regime, uh, football. Was was a, a sport played by, by all the different racial groups together from 1978. Yeah, and uh, given you know there was the sporting isolation at the international level as well. How strong was the league at the time? Well, the league was very very strong. You know, uh, we had a lot of influence from 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 the rest of the world. Our league had German players coming out in their off season. You know, there was English players coming out. The likes of uh, of Bobby Moore, and they all they all came out and played here, and uh, you know, uh, and there was some really top talent that came out and played from 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 some English teams. So, uh, it, although it was uh, in 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 patches, you know, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it 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 was it was a it was a, a strong league. It was yeah. a really really strong league. Yeah, and you had the choice as well between continuing your pro career and then also you could have gone down the route of becoming a doctor. What was the thing that actually swung it for you in the direction of going down the football route? Well, uh, I think it was kind of that, you know, I was really successful in my early days, you know, uh, in my football days and captain every single team. And, and, and then when it came to the professional setup. Uh, I went straight into the professional ranks and was was um, uh, you know I thought well, if, if there was going to be a doctor, it's going to take a lot of my time, you know. And, and, and I don't know what just swung it. It was just the love for the game, I suppose. 
my, my family got a family tradition of doctors and nurses and, and the likes. So I don't know. I just it just swung it my way to to go the professional game, given the fact that my brother was also a professional. Yeah, and of course, um, in your club career, you represented Durban City, then Amazulu, and then Kaiser Chiefs. But if we just kind of uh, pivot to about 1990 and the release of Nelson Mandela, do you remember that moment? I, I guess it was something that kind of gripped the whole nation because it's obviously it's an obvious and significant change. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, it was an unbelievable day. I mean, the whole country was, you know, was glued to the TV screens and seen the release and, you know, we knew already that the uh, SAFA, South African Football Association, uh, was already, you know, in the in the grips of of communicating and and getting ourselves back into the into the FIFA into world football and FIFA fold. So, you know, yes, coming out of, of the prison on that particular day, but we knew that there were already talks, ongoing talks, because obviously he had been out of prison. But under under house you know house guard for a number of a uh, number of months, you know where all the dialogue and then officially released, you know. Yeah. So so yes, uh, it was a wonderful day for us all because we knew then, you know, it, it opened up the doors. We just didn't have to play for for the best club in the country, then it opened doors to you were able to play for your country as a whole. And the day you do get to play for your country, it's against Cameroon, who are and, prob- and actually still are a powerhouse of African football. It's 1992. You're leading your country out. Um, can you just maybe take us back to what those emotions feel like? Mm-hmm. Because you and your teammates up to that point have been deprived of that opportunity to wear the jersey of South Africa. And now for it's that moment you're kind of welcomed back into the international fold. Yeah, it was a great moment for us because, uh, you know, uh, you just had to know what Cameroon had done in the 1990 World Cup. So they were a huge sort of, they were Africa's face of football, if you could ter- determine it that, you know, and uh, and with uh, uh, all their leading players and Roger Miller and all of them were in that team. So given the fact, and I was already 30 years of age, so, you know, I, I managed to play 52 caps from the age of 30. Uh, and have and have a little bit of a taste of it. So, but my brother, he had no taste of it, unfortunately. So, obviously, a proud moment for our family, uh, and 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 it was a great, you know, recollection of of being given a small opportunity on, on uh, you know all those thirty years of age. Yeah, and there's an important man in your career, which actually goes back before the South African national team. So Clive Barker, um, the the man who actually led you to win the 1996 Africa Cup of Nations. So you'd actually been coached by him, hadn't you, in your as far back as your youth career with a club called Juventus? Yeah, and even earlier with a, with with a representative, as I said, the district and provincial teams in my junior year. So Clive and I have gone back quite a way. And then he was my, even my Durban City coach uh, when we won the league championships, back-to-back league championships. So, yeah, we had... And then Amazulu as well, and I went to Amazulu. So, yes, I'd, I'd been on the path uh, with Clav, and, and, yeah, so it was, was easy for me, for him. You know, he actually came and discussed areas of the national team uh, what and, and to make it easier for his sort of getting into the team and into the throw of being a coming the national team coach. Yeah, because I actually I was looking at an interview you'd done before on, in the South African media where you talked about that um, aspect where you sat down with them, you ironed out little things. Um, what were the little things that you felt were holding the South Africa team back at that point? I just thought that, it, you know, we'd come out of an era where, where you had three or two major teams dominating. Now, they still do dominate, that being Kaiser Chiefs and, and the Land of Pirates, uh, dominating the national team, you know. And it was still that little bit of, in the national team, it was a type of Man United, Liverpool, and, you know, the Arsenal, Chelsea type of thing uh, back home. Um, and they, they sort of dominated in terms of the players because they were the best players as well. And they had to get away from... He had to get away from just making it sort of a national team again, so that you weren't representing your club, you're representing your nation, your nation, and your country. So that was one of the areas I thought you just bring the, close, the players closer together, not not so much as club 
different club aspects and and in within the team. Yeah, and so that was a fundamental uh, aspect about it, and just bringing the players, which I knew Clive would do because he had a, a uncanny knack of of making the players love what they do, you know? Yeah, and you had a little bit of fun with Clive as well. Um, I saw something, I think <laughs> you might be able to kind of mention, the, this might be a little story, I think. It involves a big spoon, him lounging back on a chair. Um, can you maybe just tell us what that, what all that means? Yeah, I suppose I was probably the only one that could do it to him <laughs> in that situation, you know, going back through all the years. And, and um, you know, Clive as most coaches are, I suppose, of it was very, very superstitious. And when we started to get a bit of success in our team in the Africans, at the start of the African Cup of Nations in 1996, he had his uncanny knack of, you know, riding back on his chair, you know, uh, like a schoolboy kid, you know. And uh, so I said, you know, club, you the national team coach, you know, you can't really start riding on a chair. and But you just had that that knack of talking to people and just in a casual way. And so I just picked up the spoon and let him have it on his <laughs> on his private parts, I suppose. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and he cringed with pain. And uh, But we happened to go on and win the game. So as it went along, I suppose, as all superstitious people, you know, you get your cricketers putting the pads on from the left and whatever, and, you know, and... and Soccer players put in on the boot from the left or shin pads at a certain time. And I suppose he just rode with it in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll suffer the pain if we keep winning type of thing, you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> and as it went along, I just got bigger and bigger spoons and let him, let him feel it a little bit more, yeah. And I think it was at the one day that you didn't do it, you went on to lose. Yeah, yeah it was in the competition. We had already qualified for the knockout stages and you thought maybe I'm not going to go so through such pain, I'm just going to watch Neil and and, and he's not going to hit me again today, you know. <laughs> and it happened to lose a game against Egypt, although we had really qualified. So and then I think he kind of sort of said, no, no, for the love of the game and the love of the team, I've got to, I've got to endure this pain. Yeah. <laughs> so th- th- what we're talking about there, of course, is the 1996 Africa Cup of Nations. Uh, you're hosting it yeah. for the first time. And what had happened before the year, the year before that, the South Africa rugby team in a very symbolic moment had gone on and won it. Um, were you watching that game where, as Francois Pinar then goes on to lift the trophy beside Nelson Mandela? Yes, I was at the stadium. Oh, okay. A particular day, I was at the stadium. Um, yeah, I, you know, obviously sponsors and all that. And uh, so I was there at the particular game that particular day. Yes, what yeah. a great moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and did you... You know, it's inspired. You know, we, you know, we looked hard United the nation as well. And we knew that football could do that tenfold, hundredfold over, because yeah. obviously the numbers and, and the population groups. But but you know it, it, it united the and 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 we were, you know, as you get throughout the country, you know, you get all the different sporting codes. Uh, they come together from time to time at, at awards functions, at golf days, and you get to know you know you get to know each other, and and yeah, you know, it was a great moment. Yeah, and you've said before, I think, that when you're coming into this 1996 tournament that there was a little bit of naivety from your own side. You maybe didn't feel the, the pressure that normally you should feel as a host nation. Um, I presume that would have helped you. It did, because I, I can't believe that, you know, us in our early stages in such an enormous competition would think that we're going on to win it. So I suppose... We kind of took one game at a time until it started taking shape and and, and we started gaining momentum. And, you know, uh, uh, I think you're right, in other words, saying that, you know, we took the pressure off ourselves somewhat. But, you know, to go on and to beat Cameroon 3-0 and Angola and then Algeria and then and the likes of Ghana, who are a powerhouse. I mean, you, uh, Abidi Pelé and, uh, you know, they had a really, really... Great team, Yeboa was playing yeah. for lead. Actually, we funnily yeah. enough, we've we've had Yeboa on this show before about four years yeah. ago as well. Yeah, great player. So yeah, they had a, a really powerhouse team, and you know, so I, we kind of took it one game at a time until the momentum really got in, and, and there was fever pitch in the country. And when they start getting to the, the semi-finals, I think that's when you started to realize, whoa, we're not too far away here, you know. Yeah, and and, and, uh, and but that was a, probably our best game we've ever played 
uh, as a national team that 3 0 win against uh, uh, against Ghana in the semi final. Yeah, and there's a kind of unity then between the fans and you as players, but also within the team as well. And as you mentioned before, you know, you have the Kaiser Chiefs contingent, you have the Orlando Pirates contingent, yet there was a sense that this is a real family and I was actually watching your Hall of Fame um, inductions and some of the other ceremonies you've done over recent years and that bond has not been broken. No, not at all. We're in constant contact. In fact, Mark Fish phoned me this morning. So, you know, uh, yeah, we're in constant contact with with each other. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it it, it has to be close because, you know, we endured, we went through a lot of... uh, in different times together, you know, to get that success. And as, you, as it is in life and not just in football, you know, you, when you get knocked down, you get a, got to get picked up and, and get up and, and, and do it again. And, uh, you know, early days on the international football we weren't the happiest of times in terms of results for us, you know. Yeah. So we, we grew and we learned, learned together. And, uh, and I suppose that gave us the resilience that we needed uh, to, to reach our hearts that we did. Yeah, and I was watching the 1996 highlights, just some of the games, and it was the Cameroon game was quite interesting. So obviously you win that game 3-0 against what is among the best teams on the continent. And I was just noticing in every goal celebration, you as captain, you're almost uh, like pausing your own celebrations and kind of gesticulating and making sure everyone's in their right position. So obviously you kind of separated yourself slightly from that emotion. So afterwards, were you, kind of, were you able to kind of release yourself after every game, then, rather than being able to do it during during matches. Yeah, on that way, on that top, uh, whether we were two three nil up with two minutes to play, I was totally focused for the whole ninety minutes. I, 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 you know, I obviously had the celebration within myself, but I didn't show it to too many people. Uh, I was one of you know I had to be a leader and bring the guys back down to the moment, bring down break down to the realization that the game's not over. You know, the fans can get uh, static, but us as players, we have to come back to level and to regroup and refocus. That was my major role in the team as well. And uh, I've run it throughout my life and all the success that I've had. I'm a person that can really get back down to the moment uh, and, and not look uh, on, on past glory, but what future glory brings. Yeah, and for the final itself, you beat Tunisia 2-0 and, uh, you know, you lift the trophy for the first time. This is kind of like the return, the real return of South Africa to the international fold. Um, and obviously, the, it's it's almost like a pivot back to 1995 with Francois Pinard. So you're wearing the Tunisia jersey, which you've swapped. You're standing on the, yeah. the plinth. Nelson Mandela is there looking delighted and you're lifting that trophy. Can you maybe just take us back to how all that felt? Yeah, obviously, if I'd have done it again, I wouldn't have worn a Tunisian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I would have used my other shirt and, you know, put that on. But it was just like, you know, it was instantaneous. It, you know, you didn't think too much about it, you know. Yeah. I still get, I still get joked about, you know, Neil, you could have worn a you know, South African shirt on your celebration. But the president, uh, Nelson Mandela, was wearing my shirt. So I suppose it sort of befitted the moment and, you know, and... Uh, you know, it, it's a whole lot of relief came to us because we had really worked hard. Our preparations had gone well. I mean, you know, it's not about just about the tournament. Our preparation in 2015, because when you're hosting the tournament, then you you don't have official matches to play to qualify. You got to play a whole lot of friendlies. So we we were in a good space, having drawn with Argentina. I mean, that was a abundance of talent in the Argentinian team. We drew with Germany with Klinsmann and all them. You know, and so you know, we 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 were we were starting to realize we, we could play and live with the best. You know, and uh, so yeah, it was a huge relief that we had done the job because a lot of pressure came in that last match, given the fact that now Tunisia weren't with any by any regard the favourite. So there was a lot of pressure, but we dealt with it well and 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 went through it well. So. It was a relieving moment when you could just lift that trophy. And, and if you have to know how heavy that trophy is, <laughs> one of the heaviest trophies that is around, if you just... But just the, the whole euphoria of, of the moment picked it up like it was... Uh, it weighed absolutely nothing. So, yeah. yeah. 
Well, definitely well worth it, regardless of how heavy it is. Um, obviously, you mentioned the relief. Um, was that followed then quickly by realising how, like, how symbolic this was uh, in terms of uniting the country? Because there were obviously difficulties um, early on outside, in, like in the societal and political sense in that period. So it also just helps to pave, um, pave that way and make things a little bit easier for the different groups to come together. Oh, 100%. I mean, as I said, uh, the rugby had done wonders. But uh, the football really brought everybody. It brought, it brought persons that were working in farms and distant, distant lands, you know, <laughs> together and trying to get a, into a shabin and watch it on TV. And, you know, everybody, the whole country, even white farmers were watching. And, you know, so it was really a, a really beautiful moment for the country. And, you know, as Mandela said, you know, there's nothing better than what sport can do to unify our country. And, uh, you know, it, it, it brought so many people together on yeah. that day. And obviously the journey didn't stop there for that generation of South African players. Um, you went on to qualify for the World Cup and also for the O2 World Cup. And, it, and then that actually leads all the way to 2010, where the country actually becomes the first African nation to host the tournament. Just for 1998, though, unfortunately, you weren't able to get to that tournament. Um, is, there, is it a little bit bittersweet? Because I guess as much as winning continental competitions, I think everyone kind of wants to play on that World Cup stage. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> bit of sweet in the sense that, obviously, yes, I did go from the association's point of view. Uh, I did a whole lot of media stuff in, in, in France, too. But as you say, you couldn't get there better than being a player. Yeah. And, and I'd also qualified the team. I was part of the qualification. So and I didn't retire straight off the AFCON win. We still went on and, and I was uh, implement, uh, in, uh, you know, part of the qualification process. But I understood that, as I said earlier, I was 30 in 1992. So I was 36 in 1998. So obviously I understood uh, the thoughts and processes around it, although I thought I could have played still a role from a, a leadership point of view. And, and, and given the fact that the person that came in for me scored two, two own goals against France, so, uh, yeah, I don't think I would have done that. That was Pierre Issa, wasn't it? I think, or, or, <laughs> I actually, I remember that. It was the first yeah. World It was I, I was nine at the time. It was the first World Cup I properly watched, so I remember every game kind of quite vividly, and that team. And also your jersey was uh, one of the more eye-catching ones as well. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, so that on that was, yes, I was disappointed, but, you know, you have to, as I said, you know, you, you've got to take your knocks, and you have to accept things in life, and... Uh, it was, and I still had, as I said earlier, I still had an opportunity to play for my country. So, you know, uh, at the, from the age of thirty. So, you know, yes, I can't have too many. I don't have too many bad memories. You know? Yeah, and from a final point of view, um, obviously, your generation still stands out as the most successful one that South Africa has had up to date, and it hasn't quite been matched in the years that have followed. Um, in terms of the development of the game, and obviously you've worked in the role of, uh, in the technical role for the South African Football Association, what are the main challenges um, in terms of bringing South Africa back to the top tier in Africa, and then maybe even looking beyond that? Yeah, I'm busy with it now. I've actually just put a whole implementation program from the technical director's point of view into the provinces and regions and local football associations. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of work we need to do on the groundwork. But now I've got all my technical ex expertise down there on the ground. They are formalizing all the plans because uh, our elite football uh, programs are, are essential for for the continuity of association, and uh, and I think we are, uh, are going to be in a really good space in in five to to eight years' time with yeah. those programs taking effect, and uh, uh, that is my sort of swan song, if I could call it, and you know, if I can, uh, um, that's my drive at the moment, and uh, I'm looking forward to when we can host the, uh, hoist that. Uh, African Cup of Nations trophy again and get into the World Cups on a continuous basis. Uh, our junior national teams are doing rel relatively well in qualifying for all major pro, uh, uh, competitions, FIFA competitions. So we're on track with all our programs. So it's, it's coming to the fore. But uh, we just need to 
get that really that little notch up a bit on on where they should be from a mental approach as well. Mm. And one of the things I think it was interesting. I think you made the point about the the schools game as well because there's another demographic within the schools game that maybe isn't be that hasn't been tapped into quite as much. So um, I guess that's another part of the plan to try and tap into that. We have to because I see it's, it's if I look at most of our failures are coming from the big became moments. It's like any any country that looks to how they're going to qualify or how they're doing competitions. The fact that it's a big game moments, they have to win those. You know, they have to be on top of their game in the big game moments. You can't control a game for the entire 90 minutes. So it's those big game moments that you have to manage well. And if you do those better than the opposition, you can have more success. Yeah. Well, it'll be good to see South Africa back at the top table in Africa and also to follow on from what you and your generation achieved in 1996. Uh, Neil Tovey, thanks a million for taking the time and taking us back to, I think it's 22 years ago, not to make you feel that old, but uh, <laughs> a long time ago now. So uh, thanks a million for taking the time and uh, best of luck with uh, South Africa's soccer future. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure.